This is Larry Jordan, the host of the Digital Production Buzz. The following interview is an excerpt from a recent program. To hear the entire program, visit digitalproductionbuzz.com. Ian Cohen is a songwriter and composer with over 30 years experience writing, arranging, and recording original music. Ian's an avid recording artist working comfortably in several genres and currently recording tracks with touring artists Mick Mahan and Tony Pia. Tonight he talks about what it takes to write songs and compose music. Ian, it's a delight to have you with us. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much for having me. What inspired you to start playing music all those many years ago? Well, way back when, when I was about four or five, um, my dad had this huge record collection, uh, Django, Dave Brubeck, uh, classical, uh, all the different genres, the Beatles, all the pop artists. And I literally, every day after school, come home, put my headphones on, and spent hours and hours listening to all these great musicians and artists and songwriters. And so when I was a you know, that went on for four, three or four years. And um, I remember distinctively, I got also pretty inspired by John Denver. It's kind of funny, a funny story, but I was uh, listening to a lot of different artists. And we, m my parents were kind of on the B plan with the, you know, lower middle class. So we, we didn't, they, whenever I wanted to get something for a holiday, <laughs> like I wanted my big wheel, never got that. I wanted my racetrack, never got that. <laughs> my my remote, I, never, album? I wanted, I wanted my, no, I, I wanted, I wanted, you know, the train set, all those things, uh, Kmart special blue light would go sure. off. And I remember <laughs> distinctively everything was no, but then we were walking through the mall in Chicago or in Schaumburg and I looked up on the wall in music land and I saw a guitar and it's kind of pointed in there I said can I get a guitar and they they drug me right in there wow. they drug me right in there and it was like a $40 cheap guitar and that's when I started got electric or acoustic it was acoustic uh, and well, I got you were you were doing more than playing music if I remember when you were 16 you were inventing as well what did you invent yeah um yeah, as I progressed I want I really wanted to um, I was really focused on innovation and writing my own book. So I, I didn't, I didn't want to emulate. I didn't want to cop other people's riffs. It was very important to me to actually be an original artist. So at age 16, you you decided that. Well, I was doing that when I first started uh, with the electric around 12 years old. Oh Lord! And so, <laughs> yeah, what happened was I. I the funny story there is I came home from uh, a party. I probably shouldn't say that because my family might be listening. But I came home from a party and I was staring at my guitars and I started hearing these different sounds and you know I wasn't hearing voices I was hearing sounds <laughs> and I was looking at my guitars and these guitars I used to sleep with them I used to put them in bed with me and everything and so I just like was completely focused on music and I thought of how what if I would just saw the bridge in half on one of my guitars and I took I literally sawed it in half in the machine I was in uh, in, in shop and yeah. in school and I sawed it in half and I made two arms that's that was the original idea, and my my mom actually worked as a patent legal secretary for Hewlett Packard and Xerox, and at Xerox, uh, Xerox Park. When I was thirteen, I played on the Alto computer. I was like right there in the middle of all this innovation. <laughs> I, I can't. First of all, I can't picture this. I mean, two arms. We were still talking to six string, six strings. Yeah, yeah. I took an electric not 12 guitar. Twelve strings. Just not twelve strings. Six screens with two six. arms. Right, and you. So then you could control. So what the object was is that if you're playing a song. You know, everybody was always using it for all this crazy pyrotechnic guitar stuff, and mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of have a, a way to be able to incorporate it in songs, to subtly put it in there, so I wouldn't, it was more the, uh, instead of being completely a lead type of accent or um, color, you, yeah. you wanted to actually use it within your songwriting. Um, so what, when I went to, um, the, I had the idea, and I drew a picture of it and did the prototype, and then um, I met the patent legal guys, the, ma the major um, attorneys that also had science, science, and en science engineering degrees, and they said, go back in and uh, spend two weeks and brainstorm every possible way you could do this. And I came back with non-adjacent strings. I could divide up all the strings. I could be for any string instrument. I could selectively, selectively control separate sets of strings simultaneously. So that was my invention, and I built prototypes. And I still, to this day, actually, I prefer, prefer my original idea, which is just to have the two arms 
And so, yeah, that's kind of how that idea happened. And I wrote the patent. I did all the drawings. I had drafting in high school, so I was also very much involved in that. And so I was able to do all my drawings. The only thing that the attorney did was write the claims, filed it, and in 1993, the patent issued. Um, got, and so Mike, I don't want to make you feel bad, but he was 16 when that happened. Yeah, this was like Mozart doing stuff at well, five. You know? Well, well, no, I don't know. The idea, the first time I thought of it was 16. It, I filed the non-disclosure, so that way you do, you do drawings. It's not a formal patent, but what it does is if there's an interference in the patent office, then it leapfrogs whoever filed. So wow. that, but 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 by the time I had written, the, I wrote the patent probably when I was about 18. I took other patents that were in the prior art, and edited them, and then I and then to kind of construct in a did, way did, that did this whole invention become a did, did this object this this double armed guitar become a muse to uh, your uh, to your music or yeah no uh, yeah I, I've used it for years and actually when I'm playing it it feels like I'm in the new frontier there's not really an instruction manual for it you're kind of you're you're playing it and there's nobody that's said, "Hey, this is how you use this thing." So right. when you're when you're doing it, you're actually doing something that's new, and it feels wow. really amazing. So, you know, but p problem, you know, is is that um, people don't, don't really ad ad adapt new ideas quickly or innovations. They uh, there's a cycle, and so people are really focusing on traditional ideas, and so innovators and people that come up with new things are not really always taken seriously, which is yeah. what happened with my case. Well, and let's so, let's shift gears and talk anyway. about your music, because otherwise Mike, Mike, as we know, is a deep lover of technology, and nothing <laughs> except blinking lights gets his attention, which is just not true at all. There's but, nothing happening here. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your songwriting process. How do you go about, because you've, you've written songs, you've scored films, and you've scored commercials, so let's start with songs. Do you start with the words? Do you start with the music? Or does it all just appear full-blown in your head? Uh, usually what happens is you're, um, I'm playing chords. I, I have something that's in, actually, go, let's go back. It usually starts with something that's affected you emotionally, something that's happened in your life that causes you to say, you know, this has really affected me intensely. And it just, you express yourself, or it's almost like therapy. You you start right. to think about it, what happened. And so the only way to really get it out is just to start to, to throw it out. And the story happens simultaneously. With the, you're, usually I'm playing acoustic guitar and the lyrics are flowing almost in an improv manner. So everything is coming out. And then I'm recording everything all the time. I've been recording everything since I was... 14 when I learned about so you're not recording. taking notes you're just doing a recording I'm usually doing recording unless I'm not near a recording device then uh, then I'll actually try I'll I'll have to work the part over and over until I remember it and and I'll write it down really fast but when the the, the seeds or song seeds happen they happen really quickly and they're a fleeting moment so if they're not recorded it's hard to recapture them or remember the melody and remember how it happened so it's generally um, starting off with acoustic guitar could be any uh, sitting sitting you know in any location on the beach like when I lived in Hawaii or if I, uh, just any, anything that strikes you or you had a, a heartbreak in your life or you had something really positive happen in your life and then you ended up starting to write about it and the lyrics flow and then you start to evolve the song so it doesn't always you know the song isn't always pure usually it's not pure uh, you know it's not a, a solid song you're throwing a lot of ideas around so you got to kind of pick through and find them and then the song kind of evolves so you always give yourself even when you were 12 years old you were talking about i, I want to be completely different i don't want to have the same wrist i don't want to have the same chords that's really really hard to do and that's putting a lot of pressure on yourself to come up with that organic thing that's that's happening whether it be that heartbreak or whatever you're saying it's got to be completely different i mean how does right. that stop you from being creative well, or does it stop you from being? Well, the, this is the problem: is that there's a lot of adversity when, um, from my standpoint in your life when people all want you to play cover music, so they sure. want to play the popular music. So, well, you got to pay the bills too, so. right? You got to pay the bills. You know, you or I mean, in my case, I've had a day job like a lot of musicians yeah. have had day jobs, and they they build up whatever career they might have around it. But you you know, the core is that you you have um, you know. Um, 
you, you just you just have to sort of maintain your integrity. You you, you have to keep on um, fighting all of the the voices that come in and say yeah. that you have to play what's popular. Yet you have to write songs that people relate to. But if you're writing something about something that happened, most people relate already because they've gone through that emotion in their life some, at some point. So you just got to fight off all of the adversity. If you wanted to, could you write a hit song in the next hour or two? <laughs> just uh, by what's popular out there right now? Um, I don't know. That's a, like a loaded question. I, I, I know. Probably, I mean, I, I have... Uh, you know, the definition of a hit song, what's, well, let's what was a the hit? question. How long does it take to write a song? Sometimes the songs evolve over years. Some, uh, wow. Sometimes the first song seeds happen, and then they happen really quickly. Like in the last two weeks, I've written a song called Just One Win. That's the chorus. And Just One Win um, is kind of the melody of it. And I, I start off with a melody and the seed, and then I kind of work the lyrics and then I have the idea of what it was about. And so that's taken a couple of weeks, but I'll still go back. That's just re written on the recorded on the guitar and then with a the voice, but then I can go back and start building it, which is where Tony and Mick and Tony come in because th I'll do, then I'll start building up the composition and the arrangement and I'll have, uh, I'll lay the bass lines and I'll do drum loops to, with with the different parts and changes, but then there's no substitute for a guy like Tony Pia, who is top notch touring professional with Doobie Brothers and records with and is with Brian Setzer and all kinds of other people, or Mick Mahan who tours with uh, Pat Benatar. Who these are these are friends of mine. And so when they come off their tours, I have this battery of material. So cool. th there's so the question is how long does it take to write a hit song? You know, I don't have a hit song. I think in my repertoire, I might, I don't know, it's hard to predict. You, you can't really judge for yourself what is going to be a hit. Sure. It, people, most people don't know. And people that write contrived in a way that's contrived, that's going to be, I'm going to write a hit, that, I don't think that that's really the right way to do it. I think it just has to be from the heart. And if it oh. happens to strike a chord, Do I you know. like what's popular right now? Uh, sure. Yeah, okay. I mean, I th there's, there's a lot of... Um, material out there that's phenomenal. You listen to the songwriting, the me the melodies, the lyricism is phenomenal. So yeah, I do. Um, I'm talking about what's popular on the radio. Yeah, no, I I think um, some of it I like, some of it I don't. Cri critically popular. No, some of it I, I some of it I I'm, I'm trying to be open minded. So some of it I like, some of it I don't. Some of it I think might be a little overproduced. Uh, so, but you know, some of it I think is really raw. Something that's things that strike me, and what I'm looking for is what I'm listening to is an emotional movement. But that's so. true for songwriting. Is it also true for the films that you compose? Is there a difference between composing for a film and composing for a song? Because the song is built on an emotional hook. Is right. there still storytelling with film composition sure. as well? Yeah. So, so with the film is, it's, it is different because you have to also there's hits, there's parts in the um, in each segment of film that you have to score to in a way there's a vibe to it and you have to capture you have to look at the film each cue and look at the way that the vibe of that is and if it, it's a certain emotion that's trying to be portrayed if it's comedy or if it's drama or if it's whatever it is you have to really uh, try to key into the emotional effect so as a let's just say we're just people that go watch a movie and what moves you or what causes you to react? So that's so when you're when you're composing, you're kind of looking, you're kind of connecting. You're trying to connect with the film in a way, and that scene in a way that is 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 heartfelt, and that the people um, that are watching it are drawn in more to it, and just are. It's a whole movement. So when I watch a movie, sometimes I'll get the chills, or you know that whole sure. with quit chicken skin or whatever that I call it the chill factor. That that's kind of the art of the film composing. How do you are able to um, match the music for whatever the scene is? And with the advertising, it's a, a, a little bit different thing too because it has to be more subtle. It can't be overpowering. Sometimes the music in a film could be maybe a little <coughs> bit more you predominant. Got Thirty seconds to get that through. That's the other thing, <laughs> right? Thirty seconds. And actually, writing thirty seconds of music is is extremely difficult yeah. because it has to have an extreme 
uh, build up and end and stop at a certain point. <laughs> and there's going to be a lot of things happening within that whole thing. So when I do stuff, it's usually on, it's on uh, spec most of the time where somebody sends, I have the film and then I, I score to it. And, and I, I'll give you an example. There's an, on my website, I have a sample where there's a, um, an Exxon commercial and in there it was, I was watching it. It was, there's, they're talking about chemistry and X and Exxon and, uh, how they're trying to affect the environment in a positive manner. And so I'm watching those little cells run across the screen, and I'm thinking, how am I going to get that to sound chemical, and how am I going to get it to sound like something that would, you would find in the lab? And Or another one was a Betty White one where it's a Snickers commercial, and she's running around, and it's got to be comical. And there's <laughs> Talk about <laughs> opposite ends of the spectrum. Or, or, yeah, Exxon, so, Betty White. Or, you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, then there, there's, one, I, there's an iPod uh, on my site, too. There's an iPod uh, one where you look at the screen, and there's a dance troupe on there. <laughs> so you got to come up with a groove. you got to walk at this, look at the screen, and then you see, and there's no music, and you look at it, and you say, okay, Anyway, how am I going to do that? So we got, we, we've got to get to this question. Caesar's Caesar, asking yeah. on our live chat: What music software you use? How do you compose? Um, I use a combination of several different programs. I use Sibelius, oh cool, Logic, <laughs> and Pro Tools. Now, what I do normally, as far if it's if it's, is it a film composing question? Well, or, prob- film or well, video? Okay, yeah. film or video? Okay, so songwriting would be I would say just pretty much right the framework of everything in Logic and then move it over to Pro Tools. Right, for the mix. Whatever I do. Yeah. Right, for the mm-hmm. mixing and and also the power of the, the plugins, uh, the the different things that I use there's, and, and other things in there, the, the sound samples. But as far as composing goes, um, I, 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 can, I link up um, Sibelius with Logic where they're integrated or I can export a MIDI file You've composed it. You've you've taken the instruments. Let's say you have ten pieces or twelve pieces, and you've orchestrated the whole thing. And, and then what I do is I bring the MIDI file in and voice it. In I use all of the sound mm-hmm. samples in Logic to voice it for, because the instruments that are in Sibelius are crappy. I mean, I, don't, I hope so. You're using think. Sibelius to capture the MIDI, and then you're doing the voicing and the texturing uh, well, to in score Logic. It. So if you look at if you look in Sibelius, you'll you'll have all the staves. You'll be able to bring in. You you can call that you know the number of in, you know, whatever instruments you want: violin, cello, violin, flute. You, there's a myriad percussion, yeah. timpani. I mean, every instrument known to man is in there. And then what you do is, as you're if you're scoring, you have the film. You can open it up inside Sibelius and then you're you first you start to grunt and make you know you're looking at the film and you're just trying to figure out how how you just make all kinds of noises and you just try to figure <laughs> out how to actually capture it you know your interpretation of it and then you put hits in you can also change the tempo in there so let's say part of the score part let's say it's a one minute cue in there you can have one 120 you know 120 beats per minute you can even have a different key signature different time mm-hmm. signature di- di- different time signature yeah. different key uh, and and what you do is then you can all of a sudden have it shift to a different tempo different time signature and because if it changes in the scene then you want to try to you're trying to shift around but then i think that's cheating well, here's you, just, but, you just be quiet. But it let is. me give you an example, though. But, listen to your music. But let me give you an example of something, though. So, but really, the the real um, uh, you know phenomenal thing about Sibelius is then you can print out all the sh- the sheet music. Oh gosh! And you give it no, but then you have an orchestra. Sure. And you bring it in there. And I've done this several times. And you take they you t- each you've instrument got the has, score. You've got the score. Each instrument, each each uh, player takes it, and everybody and you you get up and conduct it or do whatever. And they're all playing it. I think so what Leonard Bernstein could have done with that in the fifties. <laughs> right. Speaking, of, no, we but, only got like thirty seconds, but okay. quickly. Uh, you're a longtime Logic user, and that, this is what yeah, I Pro always tools. ask Logic people: uh, Do you hate Logic Ten or like it? I'm not even uh, using. You, my, yeah, I knew no. you. Yeah, okay. No, so you're no, not I mean, even actually, on Logic because, 10 no, yet. because the because I'm actually more focused in on Pro Tools because okay. mainly because of the card system with the Pro with the HD. And Ian, where can we go on the web to learn more about your music? Uh, Ian Cohen Music. Dot com. Easy. That's Pretty all self-explanatory. one word. <laughs> yeah. All one word. E E N I A N Cohen C O H E N Music E N Cohen Music dot com. Ian, thanks for joining us yeah, today. Thank you. It's been fun. Thank Take you care. so much. Really appreciate it.